Lijep pozdrav, gledate TV Liberty, magazin radija Slobodna Evropa. Odnos Rusije prema regionu Zapadnog Balkana je štetan i destabilizirajući jedan je od zaključaka prve Sarajevske sigurnosne konferencije. Uprkos štetnim politikama, složila se većina učesnika, Bosna i Hercegovina mora biti orijentisana reformama i njegovati prodemokratski pristup. Rat u Ukrajini, odnos Rusije prema Zapadnom Balkanu, evropski put Bosne i Hercegovine, teme su o kojima za Radio Slobodna Evropa govore priznati svjetski stručnjaci. U narednih pola sata gledajte. Šta su politike Rusije u regionu i Bosne i Hercegovini? Clearly it is in Putin's interest to foster uh, the uh, effective separation of the entities within uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Postoji li bojazan da će se sukob na Bliskom istoku proširiti na susjedne zemlje? We are very concerned. But we're also very concerned that not just the neighboring countries will get involved, but the whole Muslim world will get involved. Šta nerješena pitanja i sigurnosni incidenti znači za put zemalja Zapadnog Balkana ka Evropi? Serbia has to define its position in the in the future. They have to decide to decide what is their role. Whom are they going to support? What is their role? Ruski predsjednik Vladimir Putin će učiniti sve što može da zaustavi zemlje Zapadnog Balkana na njihovom evropskom putu, rekao je u razgovoru za radio Slobodna Evropa britanski političar David Lidington. Nekadašnji podpredsjednik vlade u mandatu Tereze May i ministar za evropska pitanja u vladi Davida Camerona govori i o uticaju Britanije na Zapadnom Balkanu nakon Brexita. Since the start of the Russian invasion, NATO Uh, has said that Moldova, Georgia and Bosnia and Herzegovina are at risk. Uh, with Moldova there's Transnistria, with Georgia there are the breakaway regions. Uh, what do you see as the uh, most concrete, most specific um, threat to Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, Western Balkans region in general? I think we should take a step back from your question. Let's look at what Putin's objectives are here. You know, I think it's one thing with Ukraine where he clearly wants to bring back um uh ukraine into some kind of reconstructed soviet empire i think with moldova and georgia um yeah, yeah he, he wants to keep a hold on them he would like he wants to keep russian forces on part of what is their internationally recognized territory but he basically wants to keep governments in moldova and in georgia that are weak, that are divided, that ultimately will do what Moscow tells them, will bend to Moscow's will, even if they retain nominal independence. I think when it comes to the Western Balkans, Putin's interest is in destabilizing uh, Western institutions, uh, weakening NATO, weakening the European Union, uh, and uh, at the same time exercising greater Russian influence Uh, through the various uh, cultural and diplomatic tools that he has available to him. So if he goes to Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular, clearly it is in Putin's interest to foster uh, the uh, effective separation of the entities within uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina to try to play up the uh, intercommunal differences and tensions and to try to weaken or prevent moves towards a genuine community reconciliation towards the creation of a genuinely shared society in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And in the region more widely, well, we know that Russia you know, wants to try to keep Serbia uh, under its thumb, that Russia you know, likes just have instability over the Kosovo-Serbia relationship, suits Putin's interests. He's been complicit in the past in trying to provoke um, political change in Montenegro. Um, no, there's certainly Russian money that is involved in meddling in North Macedonia as well. So I just, anything that he can do to try to stop the countries of the Western Balkans from pursuing a vocation towards a, a, a European and Euro-Atlantic future is something that Putin will try to do. A little over a month ago, we had an attack on Kosovo police 
in the north of Kosovo by a group of ethnic Serbs led by, by his own admission, Milan Radojic, a now former uh, political leader in Srpska Lista, a party that has uh, Belgrade's backing. Uh, Pristina accused the Serbia of providing all sorts of support to the group, uh, while Belgrade denied any wrongdoing. Uh, there are certain calls for sanctions on uh, Serbia on this matter. Uh, how how would you regard this issue? I think that, that I think that the um, I think the situation in uh, northern Kosovo is very dangerous now. Um, I think that things have not been helped by talk in recent years about territorial swaps, which I think have added to uncertainty. My my view on this is that um, the the borders of Kosovo that the majority of EU member states and the UK and the United States all recognize are the ones that should be accepted. Uh, but that both Kosovo and Serbia then not only need to recognize and find a way to live alongside each other, but also should, should commit themselves to respect for minority religious and cultural traditions and holy sites which are located within their territory. There's a decision for the Kosovan leaders to take, and there's a decision for President Vucic to, to take, that he, Serbia is a candidate for European Union membership. You know, if he wants EU membership, and that is overwhelmingly, you look, look at Serbia's trade and investment patterns, that is overwhelmingly in Serbia's best economic interest for the prosperity of the Serbian people. Well, if President Vucic wants that, then actually part of that's going to have to be to sort out um, the Kosovan question because the EU can only admit as a member a state with a defined and recognized territory. Uh, would you say that Britain's position here in the Western Balkans has strengthened or diminished after Brexit? Uh, here specifically about Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, because we have a number of uh, political leaders now on uh, the UK sanctions list uh, for endangering the peace, for uh, secessionist rhetoric, and so on. I think that my my view. I was I was uh, against the 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 UK leaving the EU. I was I supported staying in, um, and I think that it's a pity that we are no longer present to to be a powerful influence on the collective Brussels policy towards the Western Balkans. I think we used to play a very constructive and influential role. Uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in shaping the EU position there. The UK, despite the fact we have left the EU, absolutely supports the ambition of Bosnia and its neighbours for full EU membership. Um, so that commitment to the European and the Euro-Atlantic destiny of Bosnia, Herzegovina and the other Western Balkans countries has not diminished in any way at all. And even if there's a change of government in the UK next year, which is possible, then I don't think that will, that will alter that. Mehnaz Afridi na Manhattan Collegeu predaje Islam i Holokaust. Bavi se savremenim pitanjima religijskog identiteta, ali i različitim tumačenjima Kur'ana u različitim muslimanskim zajednicama. U intervju za Radio Slobodna Evropa govorila je o inicijativi da se Bosna i Hercegovina pridruži Međunarodnom savezu za sjećanja na Holokaust, ali i o širim razmjerima sukoba u Izraelu i Gazi. How could these events in Gaza and Israel affect the relations between Muslims and Jews, which is in the center of your work, of your science work? Um, I've really had no problems myself speaking out uh, about Israel and Palestine. And one of the first things I want to say is that the biggest sensitive point is to accept Israel as a state. Um, that has been the first step of having interfaith, interreligious, um, intereconomic exchange with Jews and Muslims, um, even just peace building in the United States. The second thing is to understand the Palestinians need a state. Those two things are the most important things that needs to be part of the conversation. If you don't accept that Israel is, it does not, should not deserve a state, then your conversation breaks down. There is no diplomatic relation. If you don't accept that Palestinians have a self-determination, your uh, diplomatic conversations break down. I also believe that Hamas needs to be condemned as a terrorist 
organization. And I say that very strongly as a Muslim woman. I say that because of my faith. Islam does not teach this. Um, I will give you one anecdote, and it's a real one from the Quran. Prophet Muhammad walked from Mecca to uh, Medina back to Mecca, and he told his people, do not harm any women, any child, any orphans, and any person, protect them, unless, unless they attack you. But still, do not touch the innocent. Hamas is not Islamic. Hamas is not going to take away Islam from me, and I want to be very strong about that. Uh, do you expect other countries to get involved in the conflict, if we talk about Israel and Hamas, especially the neighboring con Islamic countries, and how could this affect the um, attempts of uh, normalizing those relations, Israel and Saudi Arabia or some other countries? Yeah, I mean, everyone is tense about this, um, everywhere in the world, I think, not just the United States, about Iran getting involved. And then Lebanon is always involved because of Hez Hezbollah. Um, Saudi Arabia was, was also about to normalize relations with is Israel, like the Abraham Accords, but they stopped that. Um, we are very concerned, but we're also very concerned that not just the neighboring countries will get involved, but the whole Muslim world will get involved. So that's a big concern um, in terms of money, in terms of what people say, in terms of policies, um, what goes on with the West and the East. Nepriznavanje Kristijana Šmita za visokog predstavnika u Bosni i Hercegovini je velika greška, poručio je zastupnik Socialdemokratske partije u Bundestagu i član Komiteta za odbranu Njemačkog parlamenta Joe Weingarten. Za Srbiju navodi da mora odlučiti da li je na putu ka Evropi ili da postane ruski otok. The authorities of the Republika Srpska entity uh, in Bosnia do not recognize Christian Schmidt, the high representative of the international community, which is a stance uh, supported by the Russian Federation. Uh, there has been secessionist rhetoric coming out from Republika Srpska for years. Uh, how do you comment on Russia's support to RS's policies? Well, I think that not rec recognizing the Christian Schmidt and his uh, tremendous work is a big mistake. Uh, he is playing a good role. That's not only my position, but it's also the position of the German government. government. Not because he's of German origin, but uh, uh, he's fulfilling his role very good, as it did his predecessors. Um, he is there not by the will of the West or somebody else. He's there because of the will of the United Nations. And he's uh, necessary. And uh, Russia is uh, doing. Uh, is Russia has the, the idea to destabilize uh, whatever part of Europe it can. This is the, their strategy for the Western Balkans and for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is a mistake um, that should not should not work. Uh, Berlin has halted financing of several uh, projects in the Republika Srpska entity, uh, but uh, Republika Srpska's leader. Uh, Milorad Dodik has announced that Hungary will step in and finance uh, some of those uh, projects. Uh, what does this approach of Budapest do to the EU's approach to Bosnia and Herzegovina? Well, we know uh, that uh, Hungary has a different approach to Russia's role and to, to Russia's policy than Germany, for example, and, uh, and the majority of, of Europe. Um, they are a sovereign nation. They have to decide what they what they do. Uh, but we are do the same. We're doing the same, and we try to bring the majority of uh, Europe nations behind us against the strategy against Russia in all us, us perspectives. Um, it is a mistake uh, of, of Hungary of, of of doing so because. Uh, this is uh, not in the interest of the people of the region, or only short, on a, on a short look, but in, in, in general, it is uh, part of the destabilization strategy of, of Russia, and Hungary should not help them doing with that. 
uh, the recent escalation in the north of Kosovo uh, raised the question of military-grade weapons in the Western Balkans. Uh, do you believe that such weapons uh, can be procured uh, from a non-state actor, from your experience? Before I answer this question, let me say some general on the, on the, on this, on the, on the situation. The problem is, uh, is the Republic of, of Serbia. Ser Serbia has to de 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 define its position in the, in the future. They have to decide what is their role. Whom are they going to support? What is their way, their way? Are they on a way to Europe? Or are they on a way to become some sort of an, an Russian island with their ally far from Russia, but uh, connected uh, to them? They have to decide. You cannot have both. You cannot be part of uh, the European Union and part of Europe and be a Russian ally. They have to decide. And all the other problems, those that you mentioned, are re a result of that, of that question, of, the, of, that, of the, des the decision that, that Serbia has to, to make. They, uh, they are helping uh, them, those who they think they are their, their friends in the, in the region, and this is, uh, but only this is also part of destabilization and does not help anybody on the, on the, on the long run. This is the question for Bosnia, it's for, for Macedonia and uh, for others. There are concerns that the Russian Federation uh, will veto the renewal of the one-year mandate of EU4 in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the Security Council of UN session. Uh, does Germany, along with NATO, have a contingency plan in case of a security vacuum in Bosnia? So far, not, or at least not a plan that I would discuss uh, publicly. Um, we have to, to wait and see what uh, the, the Security Council decides. Uh, but uh, we committed ourselves to, to stabilize the region and to help. And uh, the Bundestag, uh, we voted uh, last year for a new mandate here for the German forces. We renewed that in, in last, uh, this June. And uh, I think we will stay here for a longer period, as long as it's, nece it's necessary. And I think it's necessary for a longer time. Peter Mendevil je viši savjetnik Američkog instituta za mir i inkluzivna društva. Govorio je o geopolitici, religije i kulture na Zapadnom Balkanu, stranim uticajima u Bosni i Hercegovini, ali i izazovima sa kojima se nosi regija kad je riječ o približavanju Evropskoj uniji. Kako je da 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 je are incorporating religion as a facet of their foreign policy and external relations. When it comes to the Balkans and Bosnia more specifically, usually in the past we've heard talk about the ways in which countries in the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia and that country's export of the very rigid Wahhabi form of Islam has had a huge influence um, in Bosnia, including potentially being linked to challenges of radicalization, foreign fighters and issues like that. I think over the years, uh, this influence has reduced significantly. But I think the less well-known, but today most relevant part of the story really has not so much to do with Bosnia's Muslim communities, but more the uh, influence coming from Russia uh, via the Serbian Orthodox Church, which is, of course, closely tied to the Russian Orthodox Church, um, which has become an important part of Vladimir Putin's foreign policy toolkit in recent years. Recently, various Russian organizations and delegations, religious and educational, have been visiting mostly Republika Srpska. Uh, some of them are directly connected to Kremlin. In what way is Russia expanding its soft power in Bosnia? And uh, to what extent are the governments in the entities of Republika Srpska and also Serbia uh, creating space for this? So a hallmark feature of Vladimir Putin's worldview, his overall project, is this idea of Ruski Mir, the, the Russian world. And it's possible to identify today very clearly a Serbian variant of that, a Serbian world project, which is not completely 100% aligned with the Russian world concept, but many features of it um, are shared in terms of 
sort of a pan-Slavic identity, linguistic issues, but also other cultural aspects such as shared Orthodox Christian identity. What this means in terms of, I think, local influences um, here in Bosnia and Herzegovina is specifically the fact that you have influences from the Serbian Orthodox Church emanating from Belgrade, uh, religious leaders and figures and certain kinds of information, narratives, propaganda um, that are uh, brought into the Republika Srpska, which help to kind of harden uh, the identities of members of local communities in ways that tend to pull them closer to a broadly Serbian and by extension Moscow aligned worldview, which of course then has knock on effects in terms of broader questions and debates going on within Bosnia about the future geopolitical alignment of this country. I, I think that largely because of the war in Ukraine, there's been a kind of rediscovery, you can put it that way, a rediscovery of the Balkans in Washington, D.C. And when it comes to a country like Bosnia, I think it's about realizing that to continue supporting the status quo in terms of the nature and style of international engagement is simply to reinforce and incentivize local political actors to behave according to a divisively ethnic model of politics. When you have, for example, the International Monetary Fund coming to Bosnia and making deals with the heads of individual ethnically based parties rather than the country's institutions, that just reinforces this, this broken politics that has become the status quo based on the Dayton Accords Constitution, which is now completely out of date. It, it worked for ending the war, but it was never going to be a blueprint for long-term governance. And until we you know, deal with the need to fundamentally revisit and modify Bosnia and Herzegovina's constitutional arrangements, then I, I, I think we're simply going to continue along the path that we're on with the situation deteriorating bit by bit, including, I'm afraid to say, the likelihood of a return to a more significant risk of regular violence. Ukrajinski politolog i direktor Centra za demokratski integritet iz Beča Anton Šehovcov za Radio Slobodna Evropa govorio je o onome što naziva instrumentima političkog ratovanja, uslovima za moguću diplomatsku završnicu rata u Ukrajini te o političkim alternativama u Rusiji. You often speak of Russia's political warfare. Who would you say are the main target countries or regions of Moscow and which instruments do they use? The aim of Russia is to cut Western support for Ukraine because all the successes that Ukraine has had on the battlefield uh, in, in the war, in this defensive war against Russia had two major components. One component is the resilience of the Ukrainian people, it's the strength of the Ukrainian army, but on the other hand it's the Western military support but also financial support and political support of Ukraine. Without any of these components, uh, it's not possible for Ukraine to have a success uh, in its defensive war. So Russia, although as Russia cannot break Ukraine, it cannot break the U Ukrainian society, what it needs to break then this uh, Western military and financial support. This is where it, um, it concentrated now all its uh, political warfare instruments um, targeting especially countries such as Germany uh, as one of the main drivers, economic drivers of, um, of the European Union but also the second largest provider of military support for Ukraine after the United States. How do you see this war ending? Uh, what kind of circumstances uh, have to be there uh, for a diplomatic endgame to be possible? Uh, probably there will be uh, diplomatic part of the of the solution but that will only come in my opinion after any of the sides wins on the battlefield of course i wish uh, ukraine uh, to have a decisive victory in its uh, just and defensive war against the unprovoked uh, uh, russian aggression but uh, i do believe also that 
uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has no willingness to negotiate anything but surrender of Ukraine. There is no halfway, because if, if, as I believe, the objective of the Russian Federation, of, of Moscow, of the Kremlin in this war, is the elimination of the Ukrainian nation and destruction of the Ukrainian state, they cannot be you know, halfway towards this goal. It needs to be completed. Uh, what does Russia have to offer in terms of political alternative Vladimir Putin? Uh, and do you believe that the opposition leaders have the capacity to come into power? Despite years and probably decades of repressions against the democratic forces in Russia, the Putin regime is still fighting against Russian Democrats. It is still fighting, which gives you an understanding that despite all those repressions, democracy still is still there. I do, I do hope that there is a chance for a, for a democratic Russia. I know that it will be very difficult uh, and also there needs to be a wind of opportunity. This wind of opportunity may emerge when Russia is defeated on the battlefield. There will be this very, very short period of time when there will be an opportunity, a chance for democratic forces in Russia, but mostly outside of Russia, to try to do something and to change this authoritarian and increasingly authoritarian course of the Russian Federation. Profesor međunarodnih odnosa na Univerzitetu u Georgetown, Charles Kapčan, govori o polarizaciji svijeta pod uticajem rata u Ukrajini, promjenama na globalnoj geopolitičkoj sceni koje donosi rat na Bliskom istoku i njegovoj mogućoj eskalaciji. With the war in Ukraine raging for well over a year and a half, how similar would you say that this current polarization in the world is to the situation we had during the Cold War? We're clear, clearly we're back in a world of competition among centers of power. Europe has effectively been redivided. There's a, a border of sorts to the east uh, of where it used to be, but you now have Finland in NATO. You have more troops of the United States and NATO partners in the eastern flank. Uh, and Russia, unlike during the Cold War, is in partnership with China. And as a consequence, you have a, the opening of a new era uh, of East-West rivalry, uh, with the big difference being that the East is now bigger because it's Russia plus China rather than just the Soviet Union on its own. But there are significant differences. One is that we now live in a much more interdependent world. Back in the Cold War, there was almost no trade between East and West. There was very little contact between East and West. Today, yes, Russia has been unplugged from the Western economy, but the West is deeply integrated into the Chinese economy and vice versa. So we're going to have to figure out what does geopolitical competition mean in an interdependent world. And then I think another key difference is that much of the rest of the world is not taking sides. During the Cold War, just about every country out there was either in the Soviet camp or in the Western camp, with a few exceptions. There were some non-aligned countries. Today, most of the world, two thirds of the world has said, we don't want to be in either camp. We're not going to choose sides. Uh, and that's very different. And so now you have major rising powers, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, basically all of Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, basically saying we don't want to be in a world where there's either the, the alignment with East, alignment with West, we're going to chart our own course. Uh, would you say that the recent developments in the Middle East uh, the war uh, between Israel and Hamas have uh, shifted these global uh, dynamics. And do you expect this conflict to perhaps escalate to a regional level uh, with maybe Iran joining? I don't think that there are any direct linkages between the war in Ukraine and the war between Gaza and, and Israel, Hamas and Israel. Uh, 
you know, the, are the, you know, the Russians are not coming out clearly on the side uh, of, of either party, but they're certainly not aligning with the West to support Israel. And to your specific question about escalation, it could escalate. I see three potential fronts. One is from, es from Hezbollah in Lebanon or Syria. There are Iranian-backed militias that are still operating inside Syria. So one could imagine missiles coming into Israel, the opening of a northern front. There's the West Bank, where tensions between Palestinians and Israelis are running high, even before the conflict that has just broken out. And then there's the possibility of renewed violence inside Israel between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews, which we saw a few years ago. Um, I do think that one of the reasons that the United States has put aircraft carriers in the Eastern Med is to deter Iran, Hezbollah, actors in Syria from joining the fray. Gledali ste TV Liberty, emisiju ali i naše ostale sadržaje pronađite na stranici slobodnaevropa.org kao i na društvenim mrežama. Ostanite s nama i u pokretu uz aplikaciju za pametni telefone. Hvala za pažnju.